I'm not getting super. Mm, what I, the word that I'm thinking of? I'm not feeling super settled about what I'm reading with the polls because if I'm being honest, everything is way too close for a president that unpopular. For Joe Biden to be as unpopular as he is, none of these polls should be that close. There's an enthusiasm problem on the Republican side that no one wants to talk about because they interpret it to mean that you're passing judgment or you are condemning either the former president or whatever. And it has nothing to do with that. I think part of the reason is because voters are fatigued. I think it was a mistake to start the primary so early. I also kind of think it was a mistake for Trump to start the primary so early. I don't know if he did so because of the legal stuff and he was trying to strategize about that. I don't know what it was, but it started so early. Um, I mean, it should only really be just wrapping up now. So I don't, and the reason I say that is because of this issue right here. There's, there's some voter fatigue. When you keep people amped up, they can't stay amped up like that for an extended period of time. One of two things happens. They settle back down and they go back to just normalcy, or you have to introduce something that is more agitating than the first thing that got them all riled up, which then means in order to keep that sentiment going, you constantly have to introduce things to agitate voters or to rile, rile them up or however you want to put it. And then that gets really tiring after a while. And I think it's a twofold thing. I think Republicans are guilty of doing it. The media already does it, and the left already does it by the way that they attack Republicans and the whole thing, like, for instance, with Ronna McDaniel and the ideological bigots at NBC. But Republicans do it too, and it's a problem because they shouldn't. You don't have to meet outrage with outrage every single time. Like whenever I see something, I always will, you know, get an email or a text from a campaign like, did you see, you know, it's like a mass thing. You know, there are, you know, we're under attack. Got to stop this. Day. There's always some type of, and it, it, you can't keep that going because it makes voters exhausted. And that's the last thing that you need going into November, in, into November is an exhausted, fatigued voter uh, voting base. You cannot have that. That has been my warning from the get go with this. Now, the way that I think that Republicans could remedy this dovetails into another problem that I'm seeing. And I saw this a little bit play out between someone I know and someone I don't know on social media yesterday. I saw one GOP official, and I don't have anything against the GOP official. I mean, they seem nice enough. And someone that I knew from my activist days in St. Louis, who is very much not for Trump, but will choke it down and like vote for the Republican nominee, right? Here's a problem that I'm seeing with this. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, and I say this as somebody, I, I, back, I, I always tell you where I stand, but I don't tell you how to vote. That's your job to figure that out. It's not, I, I don't think you should outsource that to any commentator. Trust none of these people. You need to trust your own instincts and don't, you don't want welfare activism. Trust your own instincts over anybody on radio and TV. I'll tell you what I'm doing and why I think the things that I think, but I also think that you need to come to the decisions about things yourselves. So during the primary, I like DeSantis. I mean, he's, he's, I think he's the best Republican governor in the country. I think he's a phenomenal candidate. I think he's everything that conservatives have wanted. Primary didn't work. Primary's been settled. The score was settled at the ballot box, right? You got to move on. And let's just, let's just say that the primary ended differently. Let's say that DeSantis was the nominee. There is no way in hell I would be going out there and trying to lord it over people who were against him and trying to further alienate them from the coalition. Because we are, as Republicans, we are not rich in voter turnout. We kill ourselves over voter turnout every single time. Do you know that a lot, the majority of the races that Republicans lose, particularly in purple and battleground states, are because Republican turnout is lower than Democrat turnout? I'm not, that's not a joke. I mean, there's been studies on this. I've analyzed. That's one of the reasons why, you know, I, they bring me up to New York or whatever, because I can look at this stuff and immediately spot trends. That's, that's a major issue, a major issue. That's the reason we lost the Senate. 
Interestingly enough, uh, back in 2010, during the midterm elections in which Barack Obama described it as a shellacking, Republican voter turnout was like one of the highest on record. And look at what happened. <laughs> it was it was a historic victory. But a lot of stuff plays into this. Voter fatigue is one. But had the primary, like I said, turned out differently, I, I would be doing everything in my power to be conciliatory towards people who had different choices in the primary. Now, that's not my job. That's just I'm strategizing and thinking I would want as many people to get victory as possible in 2024. I think that a lot of this responsibility, in fact, the sole, really, the responsibility of this falls on Republican officials and campaigns themselves. It is not the voter's job to like you. It is your job to make yourselves likable to the voter. You have to court them. Let's not get this system twisted. This entire country was founded on checking people who are in positions of influence. This entire republic was founded on the premise of only allowing authority by consent of the voter. And it's a temporary authority that has strings attached. And I think that a lot of these Republican Party officials and these campaigns need to realize that. You can't go out there, and I see it. I see a lot of these party heads. They go out into different states, different counties. And they go out and they, they try to, uh, I, I think, very in, they're, they're antagonistic. And they, you know, they try to, you know, well, are you going to vote for the nominee? Or you can, well, of course you know they're going to vote for the nominee. Do you need a pledge of fealty? Is that what this is about? You need to stop doing this to people. At some point, this has to be this has to stop being a schlong measuring contest, and it's got to be about getting results, and it's got to be about victory in 2024. Because a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing some of these GOP party heads doing and some of these campaign surrogates doing is not helpful for bringing the coalition together. And I told you during the general, when the general hits, all these all these suckers become pieces on the chessboard to me. This is a no feeling zone. What gets me to what I want in 24? I want to win in 24. Who gets me there? How, what gets me there? What moves get me there? And going out there and holding grudges against people during primaries, that doesn't get you what you want. And like I said, Republicans are not so rich in voter turnout that they can afford to go out there and throw it around and act like they don't need the votes that they need in order to secure victory in 2024. You need those people. And those people need you. So a lot of people... Got to make difficult choices. This is about the business of the country. It's not about friends. It's about the business of the country. And I think it's the least sacrifice that someone could make, considering the history of sacrifice to establish this country and defend it. It is the least amount of sacrifice that people could make today to get over themselves and choke back their egos and get together for victory in 24. And that's not too much to ask. So when I see this stuff on social media, it rubs me the wrong way. When I see party leaders doing it, it rubs me the wrong way. I feel like that's an abuse of your influence. And that's not the tr a behavioral trait of a leader. Leaders bring people together. And I think that for the voters, when you see someone being conciliatory and you see them reaching out and, and, and doing everything that they can to bring the coalition together, I think that especially because it's show business of the country and we're about winning in 24, if that's what you believe, because you're not a Democrat and you believe that, then I think you got to make the effort too. I mean, again, the least sacrifice people could make. Now, that being said, the polls are too close for my comfort still. And I keep saying that because that, well, it's not 200. It's like gonna, it's going to be upwards over $300 million. I mean, keep in mind, uh, Barack Obama, in when he ran for re-election, I think he had over half a billion dollars in the war. I'm not kidding. That was their war chest, Democrats' war chest. Uh, they're still building it. They haven't even started. They had one ad buy. One. They haven't even started. And I don't want people to be baited into a feeling of complacency. Just be aware of that. Because this is going to start heating up as we roll into summer. And it's going to get nasty. It hadn't even started yet. 